Today we're going to use the geometry of the complex numbers to build Heron's formula, which is a formula for the area of a triangle in terms of the side length. So what we've started with is a triangle that I've plopped inside of the complex plane. And now what I'll do is I'll name the length of some of these sides. So let's say this side that coincides with the real axis has length A, and then this side that corresponds with this you know, line segment coming from the origin but not along the real axis has side length B, and then this other one that's left over has side length C. And I guess really before we move forward, I'd like to point out that we can most definitely take our triangle and orient it so that one of the sides is along the real axis, and then if we need to, apply some sort of reflection so that the other bit is up here in the first quadrant, although as we'll see, that will not be important. Okay, so there we have side length A, B, and C. And now I'm gonna you know, put some of these vertices into the complex plane via complex numbers. So this one over here, really we don't need to think about so much. That's simply the number zero in the complex plane. This number right here is simply the number A, and that's because we're along the real axis here, and in the positive direction, I should say. And then we'll say that this number up here is the number Z. Okay, but now let's observe from here we have the following we have side length A is simply equal to A, which is in the positive real number, so there's not really anything to that. Side length B is the modulus of Z, where Z is our complex number, and then side length C is the modulus of Z minus A. That's how you get that kind of length right there. You take the difference of the two complex numbers, and then after that you take the modulus. Okay, cool. And then let's maybe go ahead and go up here and observe that we can have a formula for the area in a pretty quick um, way from all of this setup as well. So notice that the area is going to be, well, one half base times height. We can take the base to be A, then we just need the height. But let's observe that if we throw a horizontal line over here from Z, we know exactly where it's going to intersect this imaginary axis, and that is the imaginary part of Z. I don't really think we need to talk about that so much. That's pretty obvious, if you will. So here we have A times the imaginary part of Z, or maybe we need a capital I there. So imaginary part of Z over two. So now that's gonna be the area of our triangle. Okay, so now let's maybe write this as A over two, and then I'm gonna use a formula for the imaginary part. And that formula is Z minus the conjugate Z bar over two times I. And, well, if you write down a complex number in terms of its real and imaginary part, this is pretty clear. So let's say that z is equal to x plus iy. So that means that z bar is equal to x minus iy. But that means that y is the same thing as the imaginary part of z, which is pretty clearly equal to x minus, or sorry, z minus z bar over 2i. So that's where we get that. Okay, so next up what I'm gonna do is factor the two i out and then distribute the a through. So that's gonna give us the following formula which is a equals one over four times i times a z minus a times z bar. And now we're going to square both sides of this equation. And we're going to square both sides of this equation because if you recall where we're going, Heron's formula have a, has a square root built into it. So we're going to build it without the square root and then, well, take the square root at the end. So let's see, that'll give us a squared is equal to 
uh, minus 1 over 16 times, now we have a squared, z squared, and then minus, let's see, 2a squared times the modulus of z squared, because z times z bar is the modulus of z squared, and then let's see, plus a squared times z bar squared. So we've got something like that. Now, next up, what I'm going to do is maybe distribute this minus sign through. And I'll do that by changing this minus to a plus, putting a minus here, changing this minus to a plus, and then putting a minus here. Okay, cool. And then I'm going to add the number zero, but I'm going to add the number zero in the following way. Let's take this two times a squared modulus z squared and write it as four times a squared modulus z squared minus two times a squared modulus z squared. I think it's pretty clear that we can do that. Then what does that leave us with? So now we have this one over 16 out front, and then I'm gonna write this as two times a times modulus of z all squared. That comes from that four a squared modulus of z squared. And then I can factor a minus sign out of all that remains. So let's see, factoring a minus sign out of everything left over, what are we going to have? Well, we're going to have a squared z squared plus 2a squared modulus z squared, and then plus a squared z bar squared. Okay, so we're left with something like that. But now let's observe that this bit that I have in the right hand part of this expression looks very, very similar to this object that we multiplied out up here in our first squaring step. The only difference is that we've got this plus sign in the middle instead of a minus sign in the middle. Well, I changed the signs already, but if you remember what it looked like before. So that motivates a factorization as a times z and then plus a times z bar quantity squared. But check it out. Now we've got a difference of squares. We have this 2a modulus z all squared minus az plus az bar all squared. So I can always factor a difference of squares using this standard difference of squares factoring formula. So I've got 1 over 16, and then I'll have 2az bar, and then let's see, minus a z, or sorry, 2a modulus z, minus a z, minus a z bar. So that's the first bit. And then next I'll have 2a modulus z plus a z plus a z bar. Okay, so that's where we are at the moment. Now I'm going to make a little observation over here on the side, which is going to allow for a factorization of each of these. And that has to do with the following calculation. So let's look at the modulus of z minus a squared, and then minus the modulus of z minus a squared, where notice that there I've got the a inside of the modulus in one of the terms, but outside of the modulus in the other term. Okay, so this ends up being something like this. So this is going to be z minus a times z bar minus a, and then minus, let's see, that's going to be, well, squaring it out, we have modulus z squared minus 2a times modulus of z, and then let's see, plus a squared. Okay, good. So that's where we are at the moment for that. So multiplying this out, we'll have z times z bar, which is modulus z squared, and then we'll have minus az, minus az bar, and then plus a squared. And then from that, we need to subtract modulus z squared, and then add 2a modulus z, and then subtract a squared. So that's everything expanded all the way out. But notice we get some simplification here. So this modulus z squared cancels with this modulus z squared. And then after that, we've got this a squared cancels with this a squared. And we're left with 2a modulus z minus az minus az bar, which is exactly this first term. So that means we can rewrite this as 1 over 16. 
And then this first term can be rewritten with this extreme left-hand side up here. So we've got modulus z minus a squared, and then minus, let's see, modulus z minus a squared. And then we can do something very, very similar for the second term there. I won't work the details out in that case, but it's the same sort of calculation. And we end up with the modulus of z plus a quantity squared, and then minus the modulus of z minus a squared. So we're left with that. Okay, so let's take that, and we're actually just a couple of steps from the end. So this is where we just left off. Now I'd like to notice that both of these terms are differences of squares, so that means I can factor them. But that'll give me four terms in my factorization. I'll put uh, two underneath each of them because two to the fourth power is 16. Okay, so that's gonna start by giving me the modulus of z minus a, and then minus modulus z, and then let's see, plus a over two. And then the next part of this factorization will be modulus z minus a plus modulus z and then minus a all over two. So that comes from the first term. And then the second term will be modulus z plus a and then minus modulus z minus a over two. And then finally modulus z plus a plus modulus z minus a all over two. But now let's recall that the Heron's formula has something to do with this thing called the semi-perimeter. So let's just recall what that is over here. So we have S is equal to A plus B plus C all over two. But now observe that in terms of A, B, and C here, or in terms of what our versions of A, B, and C are, that means that S is equal to modulus z plus a plus modulus z minus a all over two. Now, do we see one of those? Yeah, we do. And that is this thing over here. So this is in fact equal to s. And then the other ones are really closely related to s. They're just s minus a, b, and c respectively. So putting this all together, we see that we have this object right here is s times s minus a times s minus b times s minus c. But that's in fact exactly Heron's formula, if we were to take the square root that is. So that means we have our area is the square root of this object, s times s minus a times s minus b times s minus c. And there we have it. We've just built Heron's formula using the geometry of the complex plane. And that's a good place to stop.